Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the National PKU Alliance's webinar on emerging therapies and clinical trials. Today, we stand at the confluence of a detailed understanding of the genetics of PKU, the molecular processes underlying PKU, and emerging medical technologies that are producing exciting new therapeutic approaches that hold the hope of improving the lives of PKU patients. Today, the NPKUA is excited to present updates on several of these emerging therapies and clinical trials. First up today, we'll hear from Dr. Ali Mohammadi at Biomarin. That will be followed by Dr. Albert Seymour at Homology Medicine. That will be followed by Dr. Jerry Vockley at University of Pittsburgh. And finally, we'll hear from Dr. Marja Perunin at uh, Synlogic. Our mission of the, one mission of the NPKUA is to provide reliable, unbiased information on emerging therapies and clinical trials for the treatment of PKU and to the PKU community. Presentation of information of emerging therapies and clinical trials does not imply endorsement or recommendation by the NPKUA. Patients should always rely on their doctor for recommendations for medical treatments. With that introduction, I'd like to um, introduce Dr. Ali Mohammadi at Biomarin. Ali, I'd like to turn it over to you. Thanks, Lex. Let me see if I can get this moving forward. There we go. Um, so thank you very much for the introduction. Again, my name is Ali Mohammadi. I'm with Biomarin, and I uh, work with our global patient advocacy and engagement team. And I, I want to say before I start, you know, speaking to the PKU community is always um, it's always a pleasure for me, and it means a lot. I when I started at Biomarin about five years ago, one of my first assignments was to give a presentation uh, at the annual conference, the annual NPKUA conference. And, um, you know, I'll never forget how much I learned there, but more, the, more than that, how warmly I was greeted and taken in by members of your community. You know, a new fresh face kind of shaking in his boots up on the stage. Um, everybody took me in so kindly and taught me so much. And this community means a lot to me. And as you'll come to see, it means a lot to this company, Biomarin. About our company a little bit. Um, so Biomarin is a global black biotechnology company based in San Rafael, California, which is just north, north of San Francisco. Um, and we are dedicated to developing and delivering innovative therapies for serious and life-threatening rare genetic disorders. Um, since the company was founded in 1997, we have now seven products um, that have been approved and are on the market. Um, and those products are now available in over 75 countries around the globe. Um, you know, our previous therapies have focused on enzyme replacement, um, but one of the things, and perhaps, frankly, the main thing I want to talk to you about is our new therapeutic um, innovation in gene therapy. And we as a company are trying to leverage our expertise in-house to innovate products that are gonna empower patients through gene therapy to make proteins and synthesize proteins, such as enzymes within their own bodies that they may have a challenge to do on their own. As I said before, personally, PKU and, and your community means a lot to me, and I don't think it's hyperbole to say that our company really wouldn't be where it is today without the PKU community. Um, we're talking about a nearly 20 year history and commitment to developing therapies for individuals and families dealing with PKU. It started in 2007 with Kuvan um, and building relationships with the communities through that product. Um, in 2017, we had our second therapy for PKU approved. That's Pegvalies or Palenzik. Um, and over the last several years, we've really started to advance our research and our understanding into trying to put forward an option for patients with PKU that is a gene therapy. And so, you know, we have a commitment as a company to cutting edge research and advancing the care of PKU and truly our success, a great deal of our success is due to the relationships that we've built with you, the PK community. 
I want to talk a little bit about gene therapy as a concept, and I, I recognize that um, many of you have heard some of this already from Dr. Vockley, and I'm sure Dr. Seymour is going to go into this in some detail later. So we'll we'll see. You you can trade notes and and kind of see what you get from it. But you know, gene therapy research is looking, as it says here, to use genes to treat or prevent disease. Um, and there's Lex. I don't think you knew you were going to be up on the stage a second time, but really you through the NPKUA, your community has a fantastic resource on what gene therapy is. Uh, the link is here, I'm sure many of you have looked at it already, but you know, we actually find that extraordinarily educational and useful in how we communicate about this novel innovative therapy. The aim of research for gene therapy products really is to evaluate risk and benefit of providing a healthy copy of a defective gene to an affected individual. And really when we're talking about approaches, there's two that you can really think about um, in, in the most simplistic terms. There's what's known as gene transfer, which is where you are looking to provide a healthy co copy of a defective gene uh, to an individual and restore that gene's normal function. And of course, you're measuring safety and benefits. What we're gonna talk about with Biomarin's Bio product is, a, is an example of this. And then there's also gene editing, which is actually seeking to change or edit an unhealthy gene. And again, um, you're measuring safety and benefits when you're doing clinical trials there. Um, our investigative gene therapy product is known as BMN307. And before I say anything about this, I think it's important to disclose that BMN307 or any product under investigation in clinical trials has not been determined to be safe or effective. It's in the process of trying to learn more about that. Um, but really what we're talking about in terms of the process of gene therapy is um, starting off with that defective gene. And in this case, it's the phenylalanine hydroxylase gene, or PAH. Um, and that gene is, is uh, inserted into what's known as a capsid. In this case, it's called AAV. And when you combine that gene, or that transgene that's in a, what we call a cassette, into that capsid, you have what's called a vector. You'll probably hear a lot about vectors going forward. That vector is infused intravenously into the individual. And what ends up happening is the vectors enter, the ce enter cells. In this case, you'll see their hepatocyte or liver cells where they're transported into the cell's nucleus. And the gene itself, that transgene, is deposited before the um, cassette and the, and the vector itself degrades. What ends up happening is the gene is, uh, persists inside the nucleus as what's known as a, an episome or a circular genet piece of genetic material, and that is then transcribed into protein. In this case, the, a functional PAH gene protein that hopefully confers the benefit of that gene and that protein into individuals who are not, make, who are not producing. Biomarin's gene therapy program for PKU has two separate studies at the moment. The first one, and I'm going to say the numbers on this slide, and then I'm going to talk about them in terms of their, the titles we've given them. 307902 is known as the Phenom study, and this is an observational study uh, for patients with PKU, up to 90. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more in depth about both of these, but for this one in bare bones uh, terms is looking at markers of of PKU and looking at clinical outcomes over time in individuals who have PKU. The next study is known as the 307201 study. This is our fearless study and this is our interventional study. This is the study where individuals are getting the gene therapy product, up to a hundred of them. Um, this is in what's known as phase one, two, and here we're looking at the safety, efficacy, and tolerability of getting a single administration of that BMN 307 gene therapy product in patients with PKU. So Phenom is the observational study, Fearless is the interventional study. A Little bit about both of these studies. Um, so Phenom really carries the objective of trying to collect and assess long-term data that looks at markers of PKU and clinical outcomes in PKU, individuals who are 14 years or greater. This is an observational study. We're trying to learn more about how the condition impacts individuals. And that's a, that's a study that is going to last up to 96 weeks of collecting information. 
Um, every study, as most of you probably know, has what's known as inclusion exclusion criteria. What do you need? Um, what, are, what are some of the things that are necessary in order to be a part of the study? What are some things that will preclude individuals from being in those studies? And for this uh, phenom study, it's, it's available for both males and females with a PKU diagnosis. They have to be willing to maintain protein intake that's consistent from what they're, what they're intaking at baseline. Um, investigators have to deem that they're, will, they're willing and able to comply with the study procedures and requirements, and they have to start off with a plasma fee level of greater than 600. Individuals who are excluded are those who have a history of significant liver dysfunction or disease those who have been treated before with gene therapy, and who have conditions, underlying conditions that the investigator might think would preclude them from fully participating or complying with the requirements of the study. So that was Phenom, that was the observational study. And now the interventional study, which is known as Fearless, has the, carries the objective of evaluating safety, efficacy, and tolerability of our gene therapy investigational drug, BMN307, in adults with PKU. Um, these individuals are gonna get a single administration of the gene therapy product, and they're gonna be followed up um, for uh, their safety and to, and to learn about the effectiveness of the product. And that study is going to last 90, 96 weeks which will include a five-year follow-up for safety. Inclusion exclusion criteria for fearless. Um, again, those who could be included are males and females both with a diagnosis of PKU who are willing to maintain a standard dietary protein intake that is similar to what they had at baseline. These uh, participants have to be willing to stay away from what are known as hepatotoxic substances or substances that may interfere with liver function after receiving administration of the um, gene therapy product. Um, they also have to be willing to use effective methods of contraception. Um, and they need to start off with plasma phenol levels that are greater than 600. Those who are excluded are those who, who carry a history of primary BH4 deficiency or other forms of BH4 metabolism deficiency, which um, can cause elevations in phenylalanine. You can't start this study if you have a history of liver dysfunction or disease. You can't have been treated in the past with a gene therapeutic agent. You can't have a condition that's gonna keep you from complying with the requirements. And individuals who have a history of malignancy are excluded. The endpoints um, really are objectives that are gonna help us better understand the safety and effectiveness of this gene therapy product. What we're calling primary outcome measures, which are the things that we're really looking at hard to determine effectiveness, are what's the change in the mean uh, plasma fee level from baseline, so at the onset initiation prior to receiving the first dose, through 12 weeks after administration? Was there an impact on the level of, of phenylalanine? Other outcome measures that we're gonna be looking at as part of this study are, what was the, what was the change in, from baseline over 96 weeks? Um, what is the change in dietary protein intake over 96 weeks? How, do, how did people's dietary um, you know, habits change? And then the number of participants for safety purposes who have adverse events that are deemed to be due to, uh, or likely to be uh, due to the um, investigational drug product through a five years of total monitoring. So that was really just a snapshot look at our um, gene therapy program at the two trials that we're looking at, Phenom and Fearless. You know, I, I know that um, the hashtag really resonated with me, you know, that we're in PKU in this together. And really, Biomarin, I think, again, credit, really should credit the PK community for so, of, so much of his success over the last 20 plus years. We have always looked at this as a partnership with the community. We have always been in this together with the community. And hopefully by remaining in this and doing this together, we will get to that point where through these two studies, we're able to bring a really exciting and really transformative uh, new product to the market to help this community um, really see a new tomorrow. So um, always a pleasure to be in front of this community because of that commitment. 
Um, just really quickly before I sign off, um, our email is at the bottom, patientadvocacy at BMR, bmrn.com. Please don't hesitate to reach out with any questions, any comments, any feedback. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Mohammadi, for that you know, very exciting and interesting update on uh, the new gene therapies that Biomarin is developing. And with that, I'd like to transition to Dr. Albert Seymour at Homology, who will update us on some of their exciting new research that's being conducted. Right. Albert, welcome. Thank you, Lex, and, and thank you to the National PKU Alliance for this opportunity to present and talk about homology medicines, our technology uh, to, to really bring genetic medicines to the whole community within PKU, whether it's from the adult uh, patient population that I'll talk about with Phoenix, as well as using some of the gene editing. So Dr. Muhammad, uh, thank you for introducing that, that earlier topic. So uh, just in, 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 in terms of, uh, of, an, of introduction as well, so my name's Albert Seymour. I'm the CSO of Homology. Uh, was one of the first employees to join Homology, really based on the underlying technology. I'm a human geneticist by training. And so really diving in and, and seeing how we can use some of these new technologies to bring treatments to a patient population uh, such as such as PKU has just been a, it's been a, a dream of mine since uh, since really graduate school as I, as I was learning about genetics uh, years ago. Because we're a publicly traded company, I do have to put forward-looking statements in here. So I will be, will be presenting some forward-looking statements. So if there are any questions uh, at all, please feel free to uh, look at our most recent uh, uh, rulings with the SEC. So I'd like to start with this particular slide. And this is, this is really the mission that's the, that's the underlying current of all employees at Homology. And we can take an understanding of what causes uh, uh, disease and then try to, to couple that with the technology that really goes after the genetic underlying cause of those particular diseases. And with that, we truly feel that we're at a, an inflection point in delivering medicines that could one day see a potential cure uh, for genetic-based diseases. And with that is really what drew me into, uh, into homology medicines. And I think it's, as Dr. Mahamadi had, had mentioned, it's that interplay between understanding, talking with the patient community, talking with the, with the, with the, the, the scientists and the clinicians within the universities that understand the disease, and then taking a technology uh, within industry and trying to apply all three of those together to deliver a medicine uh, that can really treat some of the underlying morbidities and mortalities with, with genetic disorders. Our technology platform is based on the discovery of novel viral vectors, and these vectors are called AAVs, they're adeno-associated viruses, and we call them AAV HSCs because they were discovered in normal human stem cells. And so these were, these were stem cells uh, that, that people had donated uh, through uh, the City of Hope Hospital, and our founders had actually gone in, looked inside those stem cells, and had found and characterized 15 of these naturally occurring. Uh, AAV. So we've been able to develop them as tools and delivery vehicles for both gene therapy as well as gene editing, and I'll walk you through some of that data that we have. What's, what's interesting, AAVs are a fantastic delivery vehicle for genetic medicines. It's coupled with a large database of safety such that they, they are not associated with any human or animal disease that, that, that we're aware of, and because of that safety profile and their ability to deliver genes to key tissues such as the liver for PKU, as well as other organs, uh, they've been used now in over 240 clinical trials worldwide. So there's a tremendous amount of data and information on, on AAVs that are out there today. When I talk about gene therapy as a potential approach to treat PKU, uh, what, what I mean by that is that these gene therapies are designed to add a functional copy of the gene to cells. And because of the AAV that we're using as the delivery vehicle, these AAVs can target different cells. Uh, they can then enter those cells and go into the workhorse, if you will, of the cell called the nucleus. What's interesting is that they don't necessarily become part of the cell's DNA, uh, particularly for a gene therapy or a gene transfer approach. 
And so we focus them on cells that are slowly or not dividing at all. So for example, the adult liver, it's, it's, it's fully formed, it's fully developed. It will turn over slowly, but it is slow that you could consider these as, as potential for one-time treatment for a very long extension after a single administration uh, to deliver the, uh, the therapeutic protein, in this case, the phenylalanine hydroxylase. From a gene therapy overview, if you start and look in this picture here, this is a, a pictorial of the AAV. So when we talk about adeno-associated virus, or AVHSC, we're using a particular one called AVHSC15. And think of that as a, as a capsid or a protein that we can then engineer the inside. So the outside of the protein is really what allows you to deliver it through a single IV administration, so into the bloodstream. It will then travel to tissues, and it really likes the liver. And the outside of this protein have, have sensors or zip codes that bind to cells in the liver, liver cells, that then enter that cell and then go into the nucleus. And then once it's in the nucleus, it forms these episomes. And within these episomes, the cell can recognize this green part, which is what's called a promoter. That actually turns on the corrective gene, in this case, phenylalanine hydroxylase, to result in a fully functioning phenylalanine hydroxylase protein. And this is a, at a high level, a gene, an overview of gene therapy. And this is how we're developing this for the treatment of, uh, of PKU. Before I get in and start talking about the clinical trials and, 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 the, and the programs that we have at Homology, I thought I'd step back and just talk a little bit about what does it take to go from an idea or a discovery to having these therapies available to the patient community. Um, all of these, these programs start as an idea in, in the discovery setting, in early laboratory, in early laboratory research where an, an idea would come forward. You may find these AAVs for this as an example, implement, put in the gene of interest, in this case, PAH. You then start to work on that. You understand a little bit about the disease. You understand the gene that causes that disease. And you'd start to build the building blocks uh, of the technologies that you want to put together to target and treat that disease. Once you have confidence that, that your idea in the early data makes sense, you then move into what's called the very early stages of the, of the development process, and this is called preclinical development. And at this stage, there's a tremendous amount of laboratory work that continues, and this includes trying understanding what kind of dose levels, how long does the, uh, does the, the therapy last, can we test in, in cell-based models that maybe we derive some of those cell-based models uh, from, from the patients themselves, as well as working in, in disease models. In this case, a lot of work is done in a, in a mouse model of the disease. As you build that data set, you then take that data set and interact and, and present it to the regulators. In the United States, that would be the Food and Drug Administration. You present that information to them to show that there's a biological plausibility. That the, the idea that you have and the data that you have with the therapy really does make sense. And it, 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 based on all of the preclinical data, it's, in, it's, it's expected to provide benefit as you move into the clinic. There's also a tremendous amount of safety data that's generated during this stage that you work with the regulators to show that not only there's efficacy, but there's, there's an element of safety component as well. Once the FDA re reviews that preclinical development package, that's when they give you the first um, clearance to then take that, that uh, idea and then begin to test it in clinical trials. In clinical trials, this is when you, for the first time, go into a patient population. And there's several stages of these clinical trials. You heard a little bit about them earlier. And these are these early stages where you go in and you start testing in, in the patient population and you start evaluating for safety. And you also start evaluating for a dose that gives you the clinical outcome that you want. Once you find that in a few patients, you then expand it into more patients uh, and with the, with the particular disease to then really get a good, a good overview of how well and how much can you characterize the safety as well as the, the benefit profile of that particular drug. Once you have that package, you can then go back to the regulators uh, and present that. They will then evaluate that data and then determine whether or not you can have uh, clearance to make this available to a larger patient population. I will say that that interaction, the relationship with the regulators is something that happens throughout this process. And I think as, as the earlier speaker had mentioned, it's also very critical for us to have that big relationship throughout this process with 
the patient community as well, because we're continuing to refine how we and what endpoints we would want to look at during that trial. The one piece that goes across the top that's also very important is manufacturing. So you have to be able, the regulators will look at it, they, that you can consistently make a quality uh, uh, drug that you're going to make available to patients. So manufacturing throughout that process is extremely important. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that as well. So starting on the preclinical development, so there was a lot of information, there are years of research around PKU uh, that, that we were able to, uh, to really learn from, um, that we knew what the gene was, uh, we knew a little bit about the disease, we knew what, what we wanted to, to target with respect to the, the biochemical mechanism or how that, that protein works in the liver. So we used that information to form what we call HMI 102. And this is a liver targeting AV HNC 15, and we engineered the inside of that such that it contains a promoter that would selectively turn on in the liver cells. And that what it turns on is a functioning phenylalanine hydroxylase gene. And so it's really designed to, to target the underlying cause of PKU. We then tested this extensively in a mirroring model of PKU, where we were able to demonstrate that we could provide the functional PAH gene that resulted in a functional and active phenylalanine hydroxylase protein. And that all resulted in a complete normalization of the in the animal model for the lifetime of the model. And we were also able to evaluate other biochemical downstream aspects, such as an increase in tyrosine. We also noticed that in the mouse model, in the absence of therapy, this, the, the fur color is very light brown. After we treat with HMI-102, the, the fur color actually turns pretty black because of tyrosine now being a precursor to melanin. So a lot of the preclinical data that we generated and used for that first meeting with the FDA was published in this molecular therapy peer review paper. So if anyone is interested, it's on our website uh, that goes into uh, pretty scientific and technical details of, of some of the earlier preclinical work that, that we had done in characterizing uh, HMI-102. So taking this data set, we then use that to get a clearance from the FDA to begin our initial trial. This, we call it the Phoenix trial. Uh, and this is a phase one, two open label study in adults with P, uh, PKU. We're looking at a variety of endpoints, but be, this trial basically is focusing on safety endpoints. Uh, it's a 52 week study. We then followed by a four year extension in time, uh, the extension study. We also look at uh, fee reduction. We're shooting for concentrations less than 360. And then other endpoints such as fee itself, change from baseline and fee tyrosine and the fee tyr ratio. Just a little bit more detail about the study. The, the clinical trial is divided into really two phases. We are currently in this what's called dose escalation phase. This is the phase where we're characterizing HMI-102 for its safety as well as its efficacy profile. Uh, we start off by dosing in one set of cohorts. We dose two patients. We then evaluate the safety and efficacy of that and decide to go to the second dose. We do the same thing after that, and we then move to the third dose. The idea behind this dose escalation phase is to find a dose that we would then want to characterize further by expanding the number of, of PKU patients that we would treat. And that's when we would go into the expansion phase. Just a summary of where we are with this, it is currently ongoing. Uh, it's in classical patients that are adult with PKU. It is a single IV administration. We are using prophylactic steroids uh, at the beginning. It's across multiple US PKU centers. And where we are to date, that we have dosed patients in all three cohorts. And we presented back in December some clinical data showing uh, in the second cohort that we see uh, a reduction in fee as well as an increase in tyrosine uh, in, in the bloodstream suggestive of PK, uh, PAH enzymatic activity. We continue to see this as, as we go on. We did run into a little bit of a delay with, the, uh, with COVID, and, but the, the Phoenix trial is, is currently ongoing through that dose escalation phase. I also just want to do a brief mention about the commercial manufacturing platform and process that we've developed at Homology. Uh, this is critical. So we've, we've invested in this internally so that we have control of the, the platform so that we can supply all of the material for, for not only the Phoenix clinical trial, but ultimately to the patient population uh, should HMI-102 reach approval. Um, and internally, for every single lot, we, we do more than 30, almost 40 analytical tests for quality to make sure that it's consistent each time that that, that material uh, would be available. And so 
I just want to point out we're in a, 20, a 2,000 liter bioreactor. If you look on the right, this person, one of our employees that's here working on the 2,000 liter bioreactor, he's about six feet tall. And so that'll just give you a sense of how big the bioreactor is that's, that's, that's working to, to make HMI 102. So where are we going next? The HMI 102 is really looking at adult patient, pop, patient population with PKU. But what about the pediatric population? We do know that that is a significant unmet medical need. We do, we, you know, speaking with the patients through the National PKU Alliance, um, hearing from, from, from patients as well as caregivers about the importance of targeting uh, the younger population. So with that, using the same AAV, we then engineer the inside of that so that it contains a functional PAH, but we put these what are called homology arms. And think about these as zip codes that once the AV delivers to the cell and it gets into that workhorse of the cell called the nucleus, it will then deliver that PAH with these zip codes to the mutated region of, of PAH that that subject has. It then through a process, it's a big word called homologous recombination, but the key thing here is that it's a very precise insertion of the functional copy into the DNA that then would result in expression and making of the PAH protein. And so this is about two years behind our current HMI 102. Uh, and we're diligently working through that preclinical phase uh, to generate that data, then have those initial meetings uh, with, with the regulators. So I've talked a lot about the science. I've talked a lot about the technology. But I also want to end on this, this slide, really highlighting that the entire homology team has been has focused on PKU. Uh, homology has been around since 2016. And since the inception of homology, we knew this technology could be applied to the adult population as well as the pediatric population through the, the dual mechanisms. And everybody at Homology uh, is, is, is aware of PKU. We live and breathe uh, this uh, on a daily basis, but we also like to really do our part in trying to make others aware of PKU through whether it's the virtual 5K, or we actually did a low protein challenge at work. Uh, we had everyone come in, built, take the recipes for a low protein challenge that uh, that the PKU community uh, would be facing and, and see can we, what is it like to eat a low protein uh, uh, diet, even if it's just for one day. Um, a bit of a spoiler alert, I will say that only two of us um, made it through the day with the low protein challenge. So it really gives us an awareness of what patients are, are going through on a daily basis and sort of stimulates the, uh, the, the team of scientists to work even harder to try to bring these therapies forward. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll end, and I guess we're going to take questions um, at, the end of the, at the end of the seminar. So again, thank you for, uh, for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Seymour. That was certainly an interesting and exciting update on, on the happenings at Homology. Um, before turning to Dr. Bockley, I just want to mention real quickly that uh, if you have questions for any of our speakers, please submit them via the chat function or the question and answer function. I see questions accumulating and we will try to address all of them at the end. So um, I look forward to continued flow of questions here. With that, I'd like to turn to Dr. Jerry Vockley, who is going to speak to us about some of the clinical trials that are going on at the University of Pittsburgh. Jerry, I turn it over to you. Thanks, Lex. And apparently my, oh, there it goes. We finally got it to work. Um, so uh, thanks. It's a little daunting, uh, I would say standing, but I'm sitting uh, here with, with, uh, with, with uh, my, my industry colleagues because uh, what, I, what I do is on a relative uh, 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 shoestring budget compared to what they have available, uh, that is through NIH grants. Um, and I'm going to talk to you uh, about our work with uh, uh, liver and hepatocyte transplant for PKU um, and, uh, and a very short reminder of uh, something I talked about last week on the NPKU um, uh, uh, seminar. Uh, which, which is uh, our point of care uh, uh, phenylalanine meter for home use. So uh, I presented this slide last time and it's just a, um, a reminder that there's so much going on right now. We have uh, four of the leaders in the, in the field uh, presenting their clinical trials and there's lots more um, coming, coming down the pike and you should just really stay, stay tuned and stay close to NPKUA because they'll keep you updated on that. Um, 
So I'm going to start by talking about uh, our hepatocyte transplant uh, program uh, for PKU. This is funded, as I mentioned, by an, R, uh, an, an NIH uh, uh, grant. Uh, and, uh, and it's a single site. It's just here at Pittsburgh, and that's because the, the technology is, is, uh, is in place here. Uh, Dr. Ira Fox, who's no uh, stranger to the uh, NPKU Alliance, uh, and myself are the uh, principal investigators. Um, and it's a, it's a, I guess you'd have to call it a phase one, two trial. Um, it, the the uh, goal um, is to uh, enroll 10 patients over five years, so a very low volume trial. Um, and eligibility uh, is age 14 years and above. Uh, our endpoints, we're going to be looking um, at uh, fee reduction, and uh, uh, we would, we would um, uh, as, a, as, a, as a minimum, like to see a 35% reduction by six months, uh, but ideally we would like to see that even, even higher. Uh, that 35% is kind of a residual from, from uh, BioMarin's uh, original uh, targets for um, the um, uh, Kuvan trial. We're also going to be looking at a lot of issues around the, the transplant procedure itself, identifying graft rejection, uh, using a, a novel immunologic uh, um, uh, assay to identify it, um, and uh, uh, to confirm one aspect of the project that uh, tends to be a little troubling to most folks, which is the partial liver radiation conditioning uh, that needs to be uh, used to, to allow the liver to take up these hepatocyte trail, uh, um, uh, cells. And then uh, looking at a, a whole body phenylalanine oxidation uh, assay as a measure of uh, graft survival. I will note that our protocol expenses are covered, so we, we can bring you here to Pittsburgh and we take care of everything um, uh, here and can cover uh, outpatient expenses for the medications over the course of the uh, clinical trial. This is what it looks like. Um, uh, we, we take um, a standard liver that's been designated for donation from uh, someone who has, 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 has uh, um, uh, died in a, usually an accident of some sort. Um, and in the laboratory, we can, we can take those um, uh, livers and, and sort of tease apart the cells that make up the liver and then isolate the hepatocytes. The hepatocytes are the cells that do all of the metabolic activity in the, in the liver and where phenylalanine hydroxylase is located. Um, we um, need to, as I mentioned, uh, treat the, the the patient getting the transplant with a very, very low level dose of x-ray um, to uh, sort of irritate the liver, to cause it to, to uh, if, you, if you cause a little bit of damage to the liver, the cells get ready to start dividing and then, um, it, but, but, they, but it, they take a little while. And if you then, if you inject some other cells in there, they have a chance to uh, engraft, to take residence in that liver before the, 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 the cells uh, come uh, of, the, of the, uh, the, the, the patient liver uh, come back. Um, and so it gives it about competitive advantage to get in there and, and survive. Now we can uh, inject those cells one of two ways. You can, you can inject them directly into the blood vessels inside the abdomen and you can use a little uh, laparoscopic scope to do that. But we actually are able to do this through the umbilical vein. You can, the, 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 the the vein that comes out of your blood vessel, or your, your uh, um, umbilicus, um, your belly button, um, that connected you to your mother before, before you were born, um, it turns out is still open um, and, and can be teased uh, to, to, to be open enough to allow us to inject these cells. It ends up looking just like a blood transfusion, a bag hanging there and, and, uh, and, and these cells uh, uh, coming, coming uh, into, into the umbilical vein. And we can do this uh, several times uh, over the course of 72 hours. And we can even bring you back for a second dose uh, if we feel um, that, it's, um, that it's necessary. This is what it looks like. This is the one patient that we've done thus far, a little catheter going into the belly button, the umbilicus, um, and um, uh, we visualize this with an x-ray dye that helps us know we're in the right place um, and, uh, and, and, and make sure that the cells are going where we, where we want them uh, to go. <clears throat> now, once that is done, um, 
patient comes out of, of, uh, of the procedure um, is basically able to be done as an outpatient. We, we do the whole procedure in our intensive care unit uh, or in our radiation suite and uh, our x-ray suite and then bring them back to the intensive care unit just to watch them. But um, this, this, is, this procedure has been done enough that we know we don't really get into any trouble with that. And by the time it's all said and done, the patients just walk, uh, walk out and, and are able to, to go home. It's not much worse uh, than, a, than a blood transfusion from the patient's standpoint. Um, we, would, we then are able to follow the, um, the, the cells that we've infused by a number of techniques. In the early going, what we've, been, what we've done um, is to actually do a, um, a, a liver biopsy. You just take a small needle, go in and, and take, a, take a little snippet of tissue and you can pull it out. And what you can see here um, is uh, the, the, this first patient was a, was a woman. Um, and got cell, cells from, um, from a, um, a male donor. Um, and this is a, a technique uh, that, that shows the sex chromosomes, the X and the Y chromosome. Um, and so in this case, uh, you, you, uh, a, 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 the X chromosomes are stained pink or red and the y, y chromosomes are stained green. And you can see here, this is a, a, the, the patient's own liver cell. This is the patient's own liver cell, two, two red dots. Um, until suddenly you get to right here and I say, oops, that one's got a, 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 a green dot. That's a male cell. That's a cell from a, from a man. So those are the uh, engrafted uh, liver cells. Um, we can also stain that same piece of tissue that we get out of uh, the individual uh, to look for uh, the, the, the phenylalanine hydroxylase uh, protein. This is a patient who had what's called a null mutation, made no protein or had no stable protein. And so we can see that um, uh, uh, the, the, when we stain, any, any uh, PAH that, that's there has to have been from the donor cell. So here, the stain looks like this muddy color here in this brown and this, in this uh, 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 blue background. Um, and here's a, here's a cell uh, that's making some PAH. Uh, here's a cell that's making some PAH. Here's another one. But here you can see that's actually two cells right next to each other. And then here's a third cell. These are cells that are starting to, in the early going, have divided and, and, and are, and are um, uh, repopulating the part of the liver that we uh, were willing, that, that we, that we uh, uh, preconditioned to allow it to, to, uh, to, to be accepted. Um, so these cells are, are, are present in the patient's liver and they're, um, and they're active. Um, we followed this patient for about six months after the transplant, um, and uh, we were able to show that, that uh, the, her uh, phenylalanine level in her blood went from about uh, 24 milligrams per deciliter uh, down to about 14. Um, and uh, and, and uh, uh, over over time, um, unfortunately, um, after the that the, the our, our our most recent time point, um, her 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 phenylalanine level went back up, um, and uh, and 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 we're, what we what we're pretty sure happened um, is that she rejected the cell. So we we. Um, uh, uh, we, 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 we weren't able to identify that and treat her for that uh, in, in this early part of the protocol. Um, we now, however, have, I, I mentioned we were going to look at a different way, an immunologic test to identify graft um, uh, uh, viability and rejection. Um, we have a, a, a technique that we can, we can use uh, that, that helps us uh, we call it an immune response index to, to identify when the patient is having a potentially a low grade uh, rejection. And every time one of these, these fee levels went up, we could show that the, that the um, uh, uh, rejection index went up and when it, uh, the fee levels came back down, the rejection level was low. Uh, and, and this is probably the last, uh, the last spot when, uh, when this patient uh, lost, uh, lost her graph. It went back to zero uh, or one in this case baseline and, uh, and, and we weren't able to, uh, oh, she, she, she lost her, her, um, her, her graft. Now, uh, the, 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 that, that was unfortunate for her, but you know, this was the first patient we did and we learned a lot from it. And, and we've, ident we've identified some areas where we can improve our, 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 uh, our procedure. Number one is we can give way more cells now because we know what, the, what that uh, process looks like. Um, and we have this assay, which we actually didn't develop until after the fact uh, to let us know uh, that, that uh, if, if we start seeing a, a bump in the phenylalanine 
acetylcholine, we can do this reaction or this test and we can see that. Um, we can also do a, a whole body phi oxidation uh, study. Um, and this is a way of, of seeing how a body is, is metabolizing a uh, phi uh, uh, over, over time. Um, so here, if you look at a control, this actually happens to be me. If I drank, I, I drank some stable uh, isotope labeled phenylalanine, this is not radioactive, it's, it's a perfectly safe um, uh, 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 compound. Um, and, and you can see that it, in, 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 um, uh, uh, you, you then measure the amount of the, of the stable isotope that's coming out in the breath because the body uh, breaks down the phi and set, turns it into CO2. So here you can see after about 20 minutes, I was at a max and then very slowly dribble, drifted down until uh, about 10% uh, uh, of that original dose was, was, uh, was still present at, uh, at about uh, two hours. Well, you can see, and look at the scale here. This is 10, 20, 30, 40 um, percent. You can see that the patient, um, and we did this actually after the fact, um, uh, so, so this was after she had already lost the graph because we didn't have this technique developed early on. Um, and you could see that, that, that when we give her this dose, um, by 20 minutes, she was maxed out, but it was at 0.6% of the total dose. So, you know, very, uh, an order of magnitude lower. And then it kind of dri dribbled down a little bit. Um, and, and, and eventually, if we watched, it would come down to zero. She has an affected brother and we tested him and he was very similar. It took him a little bit longer to go up to the, to the highest level, uh, but, 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 uh, but very much the same. So we'd be able to use this procedure to follow patients as well um, as, as, their, uh, as they, um, uh, uh, after they get their uh, transplant. Um, and, and so um, uh, just, to, just to summarize that, uh, we, we're, we, we have a, an optimized now uh, technique for doing the transplant. We can get probably three to five times more cells that, than, than we did for that first patient in. Um, and, uh, and, and we think we're going to be able to get um, uh, uh, phenylalanine levels down, uh, certainly below the 600 level, the, the um, uh, the, the, the target for most of the gene therapy trials that, uh, that, that you've heard about. Um, and we hope that we can actually get it down below the, ACE, the American College of Medical Genetics 360 uh, level. Um, we can also just do a whole liver transplant. If some cells are good, a whole liver must be better, right? Well, this is a pretty uh, dramatic procedure. And, and, and in the early going, uh, we, we certainly wouldn't uh, plan on doing this for anybody. But what we have um, is, a, is a, um, uh, a protocol in place uh, that, uh, to, to, to treat um, uh, women who are planning pregnancy and unable to maintain their target fee levels. Um, and you have to be over 18. We hope that's the case for anybody planning uh, pregnancy. Um, the end point here is we assume that you, your level will be um, uh, normal uh, after a liver transplant because that's really the only place where there's significant PAH activity. You have to come to Pittsburgh here to do this. Um, and this is not being done as a research protocol because we're sure it's going to work, right? We can give you a new liver and you're, and you're, and you're, and you're, tr and you're, you're fixed. Um, so this is being done under what's called a clinical innovation protocol. Dr. Mazaregas is our chief of transplant here. And he's the PI and I'm a co-I on this, uh, on this topic. So um, the last bullet here is the key one. We treated one patient so far, and she now has a perfectly normal uh, phenylalanine level, and uh, and you'll and and uh, and that's um, uh, 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 good good news. So if anybody's interested in that, you'll you can you, I'll give you contact information at the end of the of the um, uh, uh, the the, the, the uh, talk. Um, and then finally, just real quick, uh, uh, working on a home fee meter, uh, a new technology with a company called Aptitech, uh, and they've presented to you in the not too distant past um, that uses uh, nucleic acids that can sort of twist into any conformation uh, imaginable and bind any, any, any compound uh, out there. And they managed to find one that bound um, uh, phenylalanine. Um, and this is a picture of that, of that um, uh, 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 a meter. Uh, this this uh, box is about, oh, it's about this big. So you can hold it in the palm of your hand, but it's not quite a, a, a pocket uh, 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 um, uh, analyzer yet. But but you take a little uh, a pin prick, you collect the blood, you put it in this little cartridge. The cartridge goes into the analyzer. The analyzer sends the result to your phone. Your phone sends it to us. Um, and uh, you'll see that result in real time, 20 minutes. 
uh, and we'll get the we'll get it to, uh, to to see as well. And I just put it here uh, for those of you who are scientifically oriented to see that this is a very very uh, uh, good assay. It's it's linear from zero to about 1,200 micromolar, which means that it's the it works in the in the um, the, the the range that we want to see. Uh, I have a via, uh, an NIH grant for this, and uh, uh, we're we're doing it in two locations here, and at Boston Children's, age 12 to 30. Any uh, uh, if your fee is over 360, we can include you. So uh, it's a six-month randomized trial. For the first three months, uh, you'll be uh, uh, randomized to to get either get the fee meter or not. And then after three months, the folks who didn't get the meter will get a meter, and we'll see how everybody does in terms of their 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 phenylalanine. Uh, levels. Um, so if you're interested in participating in any of these clinical trials, you can contact uh, Jess Lindenberger. These slides will be up online, so you'll, you'll be able to get that uh, uh, here at, at the Children's, and she'll be able to um, uh, uh, she'll be able to sign you up or, or give you more information about that. So I'll turn it over to uh, the final speaker uh, with that. Okay. Thank you very much, Jerry, for some very interesting information and updates on what's happening at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, uh, during this transition, just a quick reminder that we will uh, be collecting questions along the way and we'll address them at the end. And so I'd like to transition to Dr. Marsha Perunin of Synlogic, who's going to talk to us about a, an alternative approach uh, to managing PKU. Um, Marsha, can... Uh, I bring you on board here. There you are. <laughs> I think you're, Marcia, I think you're on um, mute. Indeed. This okay. Is Still trying to control the slides as well. Let me see. Seems to be going backwards. Hmm. Not moving anywhere. I'll advance them on my end quick to get you up to the slides, please. Okay. Marja, you you're on mute again. <laughs> Okay, we did practice this, but I guess it didn't work. <laughs> so, can you hear me now? Yes, okay. this is okay. Great, sorry Try about that. Try your screen now, please. Okay, so um, thank you everyone for taking the time this afternoon to hear about all the emerging therapies and, and new exciting clinical trials. Um, I'm Maria Pur and I work for um, Synlogic as head of the metabolic programs, and I'm also in charge of the PKU clinical program. I might have to ask you, Michelle, to advance because they are okay. not. Okay, I will take control and go ahead and you can just say next slide as needed, okay? Yeah. Next slide, please. I think we lost the slides completely now. All right, let's go to the next slide, please. Here we go. So Synlogic is a Cambridge-based uh, biotech company that works on um, modifying probiotic uh, bacteria to uh, treat disease. And we call that approach synthetic biotic medicines. For PKU, that means that we take the uh, probiotic called E. coli nissel, and we change the, the, the bacterium in a way that it can consume fee within your um, GI tract, meaning your stomach and your gut, and convert fee into non-toxic metabolites before it even gets absorbed. Next slide, please. We know that diet control works in PKU. So the idea behind the synthetic biotic approach in, in PKU is, is that if the bacteria can consume fee within the gut before it, it is even absorbed, that should lead to a similar lowering of blood fee um, as you would see with, with avoiding uh, fee in your diets. And we know that low, lower blood fee does lead to a clear clinical benefit. Um, where are we now with, this, with the program? 
Um, we have developed a solid oral formulation of CINB 1618, which is the investigational product that we are talking about. And it has demonstrated good tolerability and safety in healthy volunteers. And it also has been able to consume fee in, in healthy individuals. And we're really excited to share that the Symphony Phase II study is, is now open uh, for enrollment. Next slide, please. As you all know, uh, PAH is the enzyme that in, um, under normal circumstances converts fee to tyrosine, but in PKA patients it is either completely missing or it's just not working as it should. And that leads to accumulation of fee to toxic levels. And that's where we think that SYNB 1618 could be beneficial in, in, um, in accessing the fee from the diet before it even gets absorbed and helping patients manage their fee levels in that, that way. Next slide, please. Simply 1618 has been designed specifically to consume fee, and we've made several modifications to the E. coli initial probiotic bacterium. That's the basis of of Simply 1618. E. coli initial has been used for decades in in Europe um, in humans, and it has a very good safety profile. It's not disease causing, and it's also easily pretty easily modified, and that's uh, why we chose that as our chassis. Um, in order to make it consume fee, we have made several modifications. Um, first of all, we've introduced a fee pump, fee P, on the cell membrane that brings fee from the gut into the cell. Inside the cell, we have um, integrated the PAL enzyme pathway. That's the same pathway that's used in, in PEG valleys with the difference that this all happens within the probiotic uh, and inside the gut. So the PAL enzyme converts Fe into transdynamic acid, which is non-toxic. And TCA is then further converted in um, the liver to hippuric acid and excreted in urine. And when we measure the urine, collect the urine after a dose of SYNB1618, we can then um, do the math and, and estimate how much Fe must have been consumed by the bacteria in order to produce the amount of hippuric acid that we observe in the, in the urine. And that's why we call it a quantitative biomarker. So it allows us to understand how these, how these bacteria are working. Um, SYNP1618 has also a second pathway that degrades feed to non-toxic metabolites. That's transaminase pathway, the LAAD enzyme that's on the cell surface. And that, that converts feed to phenylpyruvate, which is also a non-toxic metabolite. In addition to these changes, we made some uh, additional changes for safety um, that make, make, make it impossible for these bacteria to, to replicate within the human body. That means that they will not, not hang around. Uh, once you stop dosing, they will be cleared within a few days. Next slide, please. Um, we've studied SYNB1618 in, in the form of a lyophilized powder in 88 healthy volunteers. Um, and we've shown that uh, indeed SYNB1618 does consume fee in the GI tract um, based on the biomarkers TC and HA that we were able to detect. And that this action is um, dose dependent. That means that the more, more of the investigational product, product that you give, the more biomarkers you you measure and the more fee must have been consumed. We've also seen no serious adverse events. There hasn't been any systemic toxicity and there haven't been any infections caused by the bacteria as expected. The adverse events have been mild to moderate and all have been reversible and the vast majority are GI related, mainly gassiness, upset stomach and when we go high enough uh, in the dose, um, it, nausea and vomiting are, are the factors that limit the, the amount of bacteria that we can get. Everyone has cleared SYNB1618 from their, from their stools within a few days after the last dose, which confirms that these bacteria really cannot um, replicate in the human body. On the, on the left-hand side, you see a graphic. Uh, we used a very similar approach that, that Dr. Bockley um, explained with the labeled fee, an isotopic fee. Uh, where we gave um, a load of uh, D5 fee to healthy volunteers and measured the amount of D5 fee that was uh, present in plasma after that, that dose. And what we learned was that if you gave uh, D5 fee together with an increasing dose of CINB1618, 
you saw less of plasma D5B um, being uh, measured. So meaning that the um, bacteria were able to convert the D5B into, some, into, into non-toxic metabolites before, even, before it even was absorbed. Next slide, please. Um, we've used the data from the healthy volunteers um, and all we, we've learned from CNB1618 in our laboratories to create a model to predict how much uh, blood fee would be lowered um, in PKU patients. And using this mathematical model, we think that with the, with the current dose of 1 in 12 live cells, the range of blood fee lowering is somewhere around 15 to 35%. The lower end is based on the PAL enzyme only being active, and the, uh, the higher end is based on both of the enzyme pathways, PAL and the transaminase being active. The truth will probably be somewhere in between those two, two ends. If we were able to, to dose just um, a little more of the bacteria, the 212 dose, we could see um, fee lowering up to 60%. And that's obviously the aim for us to work to increase the tolerability and efficacy of this strain to, to get to that very high um, target. Next slide, please. And I'm really excited to say that the Symphony Phase II study has just opened for enrollment. Um, and the aim of this study in PK, adult PKU patients is to show uh, fee lowering with SYNB1618 at a safe and tolerated dose. And I would like to thank everyone who participated in the survey earlier this year where we asked you for feedback on study participation during the COVID-19 pandemic. It was extremely helpful um, and, and gave us the, the chance to, to modify the protocol so that it allows for both home-based visits or the more traditional uh, clinic-based visits based on the patient's preference and, and the site's uh, preference. So thank you for, for that guidance. The actual study consists of a diet running period of six days. Um, the diet will be um, aimed at keeping your fee intake um, very um, consistent throughout the whole study period. And in order to do so, um, you will be interviewed by a, a dietitian um, who, will, who will create individual menus for you to follow during the study. Um, the dosing starts at two low doses three days each, and that's what we call a dose REM. We've learned from our studies before that if you start at a lower dose and increase gradually, the tolerability does increase um, for, for the 1 in 12 dose. Um, the 1 in 12 dose, which is dose number three on this slide, is taken then for seven days, and at the end of that seven day period, we will measure fasting fee levels to see what the effect may have been. The last two days of the, of the 15 day dosing period are single doses of the 2E12 dose, which is the, the highest dose that can be tolerated. If you're interested in study participation, um, there's the email down at the bottom of the slide. Um, uh, Kendall Davis is happy to, to give you more details of the study. And in a few days, you should be able to find the study as well on clinicaltrials.gov, as well as on the Syn Synlogic uh, company website. Next slide, please. Thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions during the Q&A session. I'm sorry for the technical problems. Thank you so much, Marja. It's uh, really exciting to see um, all these new uh, approaches to the treatment of PKU being developed simultaneously because uh, I, I, I think it's pretty clear that uh, there's a need for multiple approaches because uh, not every approach is suitable for every single patient. So um, while some might view this as a highly competitive thing, I see it as addressing different, uh, different segments of the PKU community and their needs. Um, real quick, we have some questions. Uh, I'm going to, uh, Dr. Vockley, if you're still with us, I'm going to um, shoot a couple of questions to you first because uh, I know you have a busy schedule for the rest of the afternoon. So the first, the first question is, are the hepatocytes sourced from a single donor? 
they can actually be batched. It doesn't really make much difference from the from the procedural standpoint. Um, and and um, uh, in in reality, what what will typically happen is we'll get a lot of hepatocytes from a single liver, and then if we need to redose, we can do re, we can redose with a new donor. Um, uh, so so uh, it, it it doesn't it doesn't uh, we, we can we can do either. Okay, terrific. And then the other question that was asked related to uh, the liver transplant specifically was, um, until which age can you catheterize the umbilical vein? Well, we haven't tried it very, uh, in, in, in patients um, that are, are too terribly old, but um, uh, it, it works in young adults. Perfect. Okay, great. Um, so I'm going to go back and, and uh, start pulling some of the more general questions. <clears throat> um, I do need to run because I've got another, I another phone call. So uh, if there are questions, feel free to forward them to me, and I'm happy to answer them. I, I will do that. Thank you so much, Dr. Bockley. Kyle. Thank you. Okay. So uh, the next question uh, is, does the wild type gene cassette replicate with hepatocyte mitosis? And I suppose um, either uh, Albert or Ali, or perhaps both of you all want to take a take a stab at that. I, I can I can answer super quickly, which is to say that hepatocyte mit mitosis is not expected to replicate. Uh, gene therapy. It's a it's a separate episode. Okay. Um, I, I I'm guessing <laughs> the qu the question is is a little bit unclear to me. Um, but when they talk about the wild type genome cassette, I don't know if they're talking about the the genome cassette for which the rep gene has been removed or if they're talking about the wild type virus. Let's assume for a moment that they're talking about uh, the modified uh, AAV genome. Yeah, it, it, and so like this is Albert can chime in on, on that one as well. So I think what, what, what Ali had just mentioned is, is true. So the mm -hmm. episome that would contain the wild type gene cassette that would have PAH uh, is not expected to replicate. And that's one of the reasons why using AAV, you don't want to go into cells that, that rapidly divide because each time they divide, you start to lose, lose some of that. If the wild type gene cassette integrates into the, into the cellular genome through an editing approach or an integration approach, then that wild type gene cassette, because it integrated into the DNA, would be, be expected to, uh, to replicate via mitosis on two, two, two questions like that, depending on, on what, what level of, uh, of correction was done. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is, can a patient be retreated if the treatment works and then wears off in some period of time? And, and Albert, this was asked during, um, during your actual presentation, so I presume that they're talking about for gene therapy here. Yeah, so, so absolutely. And I, I would say right now that is a that is an area of considerable research right now on the ability to redose. I would say currently in clinical trials with AAV, as well as those that are, there, there are two products that are approved that use AAV, um, redosing is not done, uh, but there's a considerable amount of research to look at, at being able to redose, whether with the same capsid and maybe suppressing the immune system a little bit so that you could redose, get rid of some of the antibodies that may, that may target the, uh, the AAV, the protein part, um, or using a separate AAV that may be different enough such that uh, you could you could redose. But, um, so there, it's a lot of research going on around that particular uh, area, including we're doing the same at that at homology as well. Great, thank you. Um, the next question, um, although although asked specifically in the context of homology, um, Ali, I might ask you to 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 chime in after Albert here. Um, are homologies AAVs proprietary and different from those used in other gene therapy clinical applications? 
they they are uh, in the sense that they were originally discovered in 20, 2014 as new sequences of AAV, and it's taken since then really through some of that discovery and preclinical development to get it to a point where um, we can then start begin testing them uh, in the clinic. So they are proprietary. They differ from other AAVs uh, that are that are being used out there. They're naturally occurring because they were discovered in in stem cells. Okay. Ali, would you? Uh, I apologize. Ours are as well. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Um, the next question, uh, does the Phoenix trial require the use of immune system suppressants? It, it does. And so as part of the uh, 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 Phoenix trial, uh, we ask that each, each subject that enrolls in that trial would go on what's called prophylactic steroids. And so this would be administering prednisolone uh, as a steroid right before the dosing occurs and then staying on that for a while. And this is really where the field has, has begun to move and learning from all of those AAV clinical trials that are out there. Uh, you want to, as, as much as possible, reduce any kind of risk uh, of an immune response. You can't eliminate that risk, but uh, so we are doing prophylactic steroids uh, to try to prevent uh, any kind of, uh, of immune response that could, could um, result in a, a reduction of the impact. Okay, thank you. The next question, what's the risk of modifying a gene that isn't exactly the one that you desire, but has, but has similar beginning and end of the sequence? So I read that a little bit, Lex, as, as, mm -hmm. we, were, as we were preparing for this, because the Q&A was, was coming up. Mm -hmm. I, I don't understand it 100%, but I think perhaps uh, an answer to that question would be, particularly if you're going to go in and do gene integration with homologous recombination, it is a very precise approach. And any editing, whether it's with, it, with AV, such as we're doing in homology, or some of the, some of the other, other approaches, um, you, you spend a lot of time engineering and testing preclinically to make sure that if you do go in and, and edit and correct the gene, that you correct it only on the gene of interest. You really want to stay away from going into another gene that may be similar and maybe have a similar beginning or an end, uh, but it, that's mm -hmm. called an off target. And so it's, uh, it's something that, that, that us as well as others that are working in this field are, are doing quite a bit of preclinical data to avoid. Okay, thank you, Albert. Um, uh, for the next one, why gene editing for children and gene transfer for adults? Um, is, and they're, you know, they're following that with sort of a second question of, it, you know, perhaps due to the higher li liver turnover in children. And that is, that's, that's, the, uh, that's the idea. Um, so in adults, the liver's fully formed, it, you know, it will, turn over slowly over time. Um, but in children, as they go through that growth phase, that, that rate of liver um, growth and, and, and uh, division is significantly higher as the children are younger and moving on. And so that's, that's why from an editing perspective to integrate into the cell's DNA such that that earlier question, each time that hepatocyte replicates through mitosis, that mm -hmm. those daughter cells theoretically would have that correction as well. So that's, that's the, uh, that's the, the idea behind in editing for, for pediatrics and a gene transfer for, for adults. Great, thank you. Um, what was the AAV used in the pr presented study? I, I, I think this question goes to, um, to both uh, Albert and Ali, um, if you all want to comment a little more about that. I could just quickly say that Biomarin intends to use uh, AAV serotype 5, AAV5. Okay. Thank you, Ellie. And for, for homology, um, in the Phoenix trial, we're using AAV HSC15. Okay, thank you. And then uh, the last question that I have is, have you seen the same reductions in fee from gene therapy in mice as in patients. So this is always, you know, the, 
the eternal question of how well do animal models predict <laughs> human outcomes. <laughs> uh, I, I, and I suppose uh, uh, this is a question that everybody could take a stab at because every every treatment that we've talked about today uh, you know, was first explored in a, in a mouse model. So Marge, I would ask you um, to chime in in a minute too, or now actually, I see. Sure, sure, I'll take the first stab at that. I think uh, our, our challenge is that mouse, the mouse gut is very different to the human gut. The transit mm -hmm. time is, is not at all comparable and the microbiome in the mouse gut is also not at all comparable. So mm -hmm. that mouse model, probably doesn't translate one-to-one -to, -one to human data and that that remains to be seen and that's actually one of the key uh, key um, goals for our our symphony trial as well as to understand how well our modeling really um, can predict the PLORing and PKU patients and how we can assess the healthy volunteer data and compare that to patient data. Terrific, thank you. Albert Ali. Yep, so, so I, I think it's a terrific question. It's something that we use these animal models for to try to get an indication of if you replace phenylalanine hydroxylase activity, do you see a reduction in fee? And we do, we see that in the mice and we see it very rapid. Um, I think if you, if you look at some of the data that we presented from the Phoenix trial uh, back in December that, 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 that publicly available, uh, you do see it in the second dose court, you start to see a reduction of fee um, early on. What, what we don't know is how, how quickly and the rate in which that, that, that gene expression from the AV uh, it ha that you see in the mouse, in the mice, how, how rapidly that, that works in humans. And that's why we're going through the clinical trial and clinical development to, to really characterize and assess that. Uh, because um, we're the first gene therapy trial in PKU. And so it's, uh, uh, you know, we're learning as we, as we go along. But I think that's a, it's something that you look at across all different animal models on on that translational aspect and, 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 you know, the mouse is a great model to test that, but it's also, uh, you know, very different metabolically than a, than a human. Yeah, I would just say, you know, we don't, we don't have data, you know, at this point in, in humans to, to be able to say whether there's the same reductions in fee from gene therapy. What I'll say, of course, is, and I think it's the case for, for all of us, you know, the, the, the hope and the promise that, you know, we are, we see in, those early models, you know, we, we hope to translate into positive benefit for our patient population. So more to come. Great, thank you. And one last question, um, and Marcia, this is for you. I think the, the fact that, bac that the bacteria does not replicate um, means that you become dependent on consuming the treatment. And I think I might rephrase that and, and ask the question, what kind of dose schedule do you anticipate uh, patients? Is it a daily or every other day, or is there not yet enough information to know? Right, so that, that's true, and that's actually one of the features that makes the, syn uh, the, the synthetic biotic medicine very much like a, a regular drug, traditional drug, because you know exactly when you give a certain amount of bacteria, you know what the effect size will be, because they don't go don't don't go rogue and replicate in the gut and then all of a sudden you know what's happening at all so for the current trial it is given three times a day and that's obviously something that we will explore in further trials as well as well what is the optimal schedule and what is the optimal dosing time great thank you very much so that brings to a conclusion today of the uh, NPKUA webinar and I would like to thank all the participants who presented today, uh, I mean, it's very exciting to see what's going on out there in the uh, drug discovery, drug development community. And um, I know each and every one of you all are very busy and uh, want to thank you and recognize the, you know, the effort it took to take the time out of your guys' day to do this. Um, also, I want to thank all the participants that we've seen. Um, it, it was uh, great to have you on board, and I hope you all learned a lot. Uh, you can get information on all these therapies and clinical trials from, you know, the websites of the, of the, of the companies or from University of Pittsburgh. 
And always, if you're interested in what clinical trials are active in recruiting, I would direct you to, to clinicaltrials.gov. So with that, um, thank you all very much for attending, and I'd like to bring this to a conclusion today.